We're the Cliffords, and we'd like to welcome you to this week's online service. I'm Sarah. I'm Ken. And I'm Paul. We've been encouraged uh, recently and throughout this year by some scripture from the book of Hebrews. I'd like to share uh, from chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now please stand and let's worship our Lord together. The work is finished, the 
end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living Lord hallelujah praise the
lives in me, lives in me. Every kid down at Creekside liked candy a lot, but the bad virus called COVID-19 did not. COVID-19 loathed candy and Halloween as well. Now please don't ask why, for no one can tell. But whatever the reason, whatever it be, COVID wanted to cancel Candy Company. He didn't want candy. All games would be banned. There surely would be no life-size candy land. This event is no more, COVID said with insistence. Crowds in Creekside's building cannot social distance. But COVID didn't count on the plucky know-how of Bethany Onwera and Genevieve Yao. Yes, the kidsmen directors we all love a lot would foil the villain COVID's evil plot. To save the day, they then conceived of a plan. Let's change Candy Co. to Candy Caravan. On Halloween day, from the hours two to five, through Creekside's parking lot, the families would drive. Gloved and masked volunteers would share candy and treats, and delighted children would leave with the sweets. They hoped to see Creeksiders gamely attired, costumes quite encouraged, but not quite required. If of candy and dressing up you are a fan, please join us next month at Candy Caravan. All kids and their families and friends are invited to join us for Candy Caravan on October 31st. Just dress up and drive your car through the Creekside parking lot between 2 and 5 p.m. and volunteers in masks and gloves will hand out pre-wrapped goodie bags of treats and snacks. This event is free and open to everyone. 
If you would like to volunteer for this event, please contact Bethany Onwera at bethany at creeksidecommunity.org. If you're new and would like more information about Creekside, please click on the New Here link on our website. All kids can find this week's Sunday School lesson on our Facebook page or website. Creekside is now holding outdoor in-person services on Sundays at 9 o'clock and 10.30 a.m. If you would like to attend, please pre-register at creeksidecommunity.org slash in-person services. Thanks for joining us for online service today. Uh, Jeff and I have decided to lump all of John 7 and 8 under one topic, Doubt Has Its Reasons. Um, beginning in chapter 7 through, I think halfway through chapter 10, all covers a single week of Jesus' ministry in his final year. It all happens at the Feast of Booths or uh, Feast of Tabernacles. And John records not only what Jesus teaches during that week, but he records how people react to what Jesus teach. And some people believe, and some people do not. And so we're focusing on the people who did not believe in Jesus and, and why they didn't believe. And I, I think this series is going to be helpful to a lot of people, if, if you're not a believer in Jesus, it may help you to understand why and, and identify the specific doubts uh, that you're struggling with. If you are a believer in Jesus and, and you struggle with doubts, it's going to help you to identify and understand those doubts and understand what to do with them. And if you're talking to people who have doubts, it will help you to help, help them. The, the point is, the Bible does not ignore uh, doubts. It takes doubts very seriously and, and endeavors to answer them. Last week, Jeff looked at verses 1 through 24 and gave us two reasons we doubt. One was familiarity and the other was intellectualism. Today, we're going to look at verses 25 through 52 and identify two more reasons that people doubt. One is prejudice and the other is peer pressure. So let's, uh, let's pray and we'll jump into this passage. Thank you, Father, for your promise that this book of the law shall not depart from our mouth, but we shall meditate on it day and night so that we may make our way prosperous, be careful to do all that is in it, and have success. Thank you that your word is a light to our paths and a lamp to our feet. And uh, we pray that you will be our teacher as we open the scriptures today. In Jesus' name, amen. First reason. Uh, in this passage that we're going to look at and why people don't believe, why they doubt Jesus, is prejudice. Some people uh, think of prejudice as the same thing as bigotry. Bigotry is hatred or intolerance of a person or a belief. And we're going to talk about bigotry and its role in creating doubt next week. But prejudice is different. Prejudice is simply prejudging uh, making up our minds without uh, looking at all the facts, uh, pre-judging. Years ago, Arnold Toynbee, the eminent British historian, spoke at Stanford University, and, and he made a, a comment that has become very famous since then. He said, most people reject Christ on the basis of a caricature, uh, meaning that people who, 
who reject Christianity, reject Christ, don't do it because they've looked at the facts, but more on the basis of misconceptions. Because of misconceptions and misinformation they have about Jesus or they have about the faith, it prejudices them about looking further into it. Let me give you some examples of that. Uh, today, a lot of people believe automatically that the Bible is full of contradictions or that the God of the Bible is an angry, bloodthirsty, vindictive God or anything that claims to be the only truth cannot be true. Our being a Christian requires us to suppress our natural desires and turns us into neurotic, repressed, and judgmental monsters. Our Christianity has always stood in the way of progress, science, and equal rights, and has been the tool of the oppressor. And because people accept those, those misconceptions, they, they prejudge Christ, they prejudge Christianity, they don't even investigate it, they, they walk away. Well, Jesus had to deal with those same kinds of misconceptions that people prejudged him on and dismissed him. And that's what we're going to look at in this passage that follows, beginning at verse 25. So some of the people of Jerusalem were saying, is this not the man whom they are seeking to kill? Look, he is speaking publicly, and they are saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? However, we know where this man is from, but wherever the Christ may come, whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. During the feasts, of tabernacles, Jerusalem was swelled a several times its normal population as people from all over the country and from outside the country would come to celebrate the feast. But this particular conversation that John is, is recording here is among the locals, the, the people of Jerusalem, who have an inside track about what's really happening in the city, and they know that their rulers are intending to arrest Jesus. And so their question is, well, what are they waiting for? Why haven't they arrested him yet? They don't really think he's the Messiah, do they? Because we know he's not. Now, what I want you to notice here is why these people are so confident that Jesus is not the Messiah. They say, we know that when the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. But we know where Jesus is from. Uh, Jesus is from Galilee. He's been coming to Jerusalem for years. Uh, Therefore, he can't be the Messiah. One of the popular ideas of that time uh, among Jews was that when the Messiah appeared, he would just come out of nowhere. He would just uh, appear out of thin air that no one would know him, no one would know where he was from. And obviously that doesn't fit Jesus because people know about Jesus. Jesus has been around for a long time. Now, that that idea that the Messiah would, would just suddenly appear out of nowhere is not in the Bible. It wasn't based on Scripture. It was just a popular misconception. But because these people believe that misconception, they prejudge Jesus, they don't look at any of the other evidence, they immediately assume that he can't be the Messiah. I want you to notice how Jesus uh, deals with this. Then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, you both know me and know where I'm from, and I've not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. Jesus' answer here is, the issue is not whether you know that where I'm from. The issue here is whether I'm from God, and I have given you ample evidence that I have come from God because I do the things only God can do. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? Some of the people believe, some of the people don't believe. The people who believe simply look at the facts and they say, if Jesus isn't the Messiah, who is he? Nobody can do the miracles that he does. The people who don't believe say he doesn't fit into this criteria that we believe the Messiah should. They prejudge Jesus. They refuse to look at the evidence. And we do those things all the time. Uh, 
All of us have doubts. The question is not do I have doubts, but what do I do with them? Do I hang on to them, or do I get more information? Um, I struggled with doubts at a point in my life years ago, and uh, could not find relief until I looked at each doubt and researched it to see if it held any water. I just had to say, if, if, if this is a reason not to believe in Christ, then I won't believe in Christ, but I have to know what's true. And, and what I found is, the more I faced my doubts, the more I embraced those doubts and began to investigate what I was really doubting, the more my faith grew because I found out there were answers to each one. Let's look at some of those misconceptions I mentioned early on that, that many people use to, to prejudge Jesus and not even look at him. Is, is the Bible full of contradictions? I, when I first started reading, I thought it was. Uh, most of the seeming contradictions in the Bible come from different accounts of the same uh, incident. For example, in Matthew, Matthew says both of the thieves who were crucified with Jesus were mocking him along with the rest of the crowds. Yet in Mark, Mark tells us that one of the thief mocks Jesus. The other says, says we are receiving what we, we deserve. This, this man is innocent. He's done nothing wrong. So is that a contradiction? Well, a contradiction is two facts, both of which cannot be true. So it is impossible for Matthew's account and Mark's account to both be true? And the answer is, of course. Uh, they're just looking at the situation at different times. In the beginning, both of the thieves are mocking Jesus. But then one of the thieves has a pang of conscience, and he realizes how hypocritical his mocking is. He says, we are being crucified for what we've done, but this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, uh, today you'll be with me in paradise. As you look at a lot of the apparent contradictions of the Bible, you find they're not contradictions at all. They're just looking at the same event from different perspectives, which to me proves that the gospel writers were not colluding together because they don't tell the same story. They tell the story from their own perspectives, and when you put all the gospels together, we get a full, uh, a full view of that. When people say there are contradictions in the Bible, I just say, could you show me one, please? And I've never had anyone who, who showed me one that, that held water. How about uh, the second one here? The God of the Bible is an angry, bloodthirsty, vindictive God. The Bible is one story. And the Bible teaches that God is holy and just and, and avenges evil and punishes the wicked. But it also teaches that he is slow to anger. Uh, quick to forgive. And in fact, when you read the whole story of the Bible, you realize that this is a love story, that God loves people so much that he sends his son to rescue us from, from the dilemma that sin and death have placed us into. And so again, when you read the whole story, you see that God is righteous, he's just, he's also loving, and those don't contradict each other. How about the third uh, misconception that anything that claims to be the only truth cannot be true? Well, first of all, that's a self-defeating statement, isn't it? The, 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 the statement disproves itself because if it's saying anything that claims to be true, the only truth cannot be true, well, that would include that statement too. So it disproves itself. Second, the fact that, that anyone claims to have the only truth that doesn't mean it's automatically wrong. It, it could be right. It may be narrow. It may sound intolerant, but that doesn't mean it's not true. If, if you look at all the religions of the world, um, you'll find the deeper you look at them, the more they contradict each other. Uh, Hinduism teaches that God is impersonal, that, that God does not think or see or speak or feel. God is just an impersonal force. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam teach a personal God, that God uh, thinks, he sees, he purposes, he feels, he acts, he, he, he plans, all these things. Now, God can't be personal and impersonal at the same time. Buddhism doesn't even teach there's a God. Buddhism is agnostic about God. Uh, 
all of the religions disagree about the eternal state of people and how we get there. In fact, uh, Bertrand Russell, one of the uh, most famous atheists of all times, once proved, simply using the law of non-contradiction, that either all religions are false, or one religion is true and all the rest are false, but it is impossible for them to all be true, all be paths to the same place, since they contradict each other. And so for Jesus to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father through me, that does not make him false. It might make him narrow, it might make him exclusive, but that doesn't make him false. How about being a a Christian requires us to suppress our natural desires and turns us into neurotic, repressed, and judgmental monsters. That's certainly the way many authors, many script writers have portrayed Christians over the years. But people who know Christ know that our problem is not our natural desires. Our problem is the sin that lives within us and constantly moves us towards self-destruction. And that when Christ comes into our lives, he releases us from the power of the sin, that sin. And the more we follow him, the happier we are, the more loving we are, and the less judgmental we are. Are there repressed religious people in the world? Certainly there are. But they're not people who have believed in Jesus because Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Has Christianity always stood in the way of progress, science, equal rights, and been the tool of the oppressor. That's, uh, a lot of people dismiss Christianity immediately because they say it's anti-science, it's anti-rational, it, you have to be uh, a, a Luddite to believe it. But that's not what history tells us. In fact, the first scientists were all Christians. Galileo, Copernicus, and, and many others, that Christianity laid the worldview for science because Christians believe in a rational, orderly God who creates a rationally rational, predictable universe which could be studied rather than worshipped and feared. That, that Christianity forms the foundation, the philosophical foundation for science. And because of, of Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself, wherever the uh, Christianity and the gospel has spread, civilization has spread. Uh, the place of women and children rises. Violence goes down. Uh, education, uh, care for the poor and for the needy spreads. You cannot imagine a world without the message of Christ. These are all misconceptions that people often, because they believe them, they, pr they prejudice them against the gospel, it prejudice them, and so they won't even look at those, and yet those are all misconceptions. Well, let's read on back to John 7 here. The Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore, Jesus said, for a little while longer, I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? The dispersion refers to all the Jews who are living outside of, of Israel. And so they say, is he leaving the country? Where's Jesus going when he says, I'm going away? Is he going to go, when he says, teach the Greeks, he's not talking about literal Greeks, he's talking about Jews who, who live in those regions. They, these people are confused. They don't understand what, what Jesus is saying. What is the statement that he said, you will seek me and not, will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Now, when we read that, because we know the whole story of the Bible, we know exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying he's not leaving the country, he's leaving the earth. And he's going back to the Father who sent him. That's, the, that's really the story of the Bible. God sends his Son to become a human being to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Jesus comes and preaches the kingdom of God. Then he's rejected, crucified, uh, dies in our place, rises from the dead for us, and then leaves, and everyone who believes believes that message, receives eternal life. But, but these folks don't have that. They don't know the whole story yet. And so when he says, I'm going somewhere you can't go, I am leaving, they have no idea. What I want you to see here is that Jesus is often confusing. He's confusing to non-believers. He's often confusing to believers. We will always have doubts. We will all have, always have confusion. Faith is not simply being intellectually 
convinced because faith is not just involved the mind, it involves the heart. And that's why Jesus goes on now and gets to the real issue. At verse 37, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him would receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is an eight-day feast. And for the first seven days, every day, uh, the high priest would take a golden pitcher and he would pour out water on the altar. And this symbolized the water that God had sent all that year through rain for the, for the harvest that they were celebrating. But on the eighth day of the feast, the, the, the priest did not pour out the water because this was to symbolize the people's prayer that they needed God to provide water for the coming year. And it is on that day that Jesus stands up and loudly says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Jesus pictures the coming of the Holy Spirit like God pouring out rain upon the earth and and the Spirit coming into our lives and, and, and quenching the thirst that nothing else can quench. It's, it's like we saw with the woman at the well. Jesus says, everyone who drinks of the water of this well will thirst again. But he who, th- who drinks of the water I give him will never thirst again. That's the picture of the Spirit. The Spirit quenches our thirst and not only quenches our thirst, but quenches other people's thirst through us. Uh, it, it, he becomes rivers of water that pour out of us. He blesses us so that we can we can. Bless others. Now, here's the question I want to ask. Who comes to Jesus? Whoever is thirsty. Whoever knows that that they need something more. Whoever knows that the things that they've looked to to satisfy them in this world just haven't done the job. And unless we have that thirst, all of our all of our questions being answered will mean nothing. I I have spent hours answering people's questions about Christianity only to have them walk away and say, sorry, I'm not really interested. And I've seen even Christians who, who know the facts about Jesus still walk away from him because they really don't think they need him. It, it is really, belief is an issue of the heart. And if I know I need Christ, misconceptions will not keep me from coming to him. I will study, I will look, I will investigate, uh, get past those doubts. If I don't think I need him, then it doesn't take much to keep me from him. And that becomes obvious in the, in the following passage for another misconception. Verse 40. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, this is certainly the prophet. Moses had promised that God would send another prophet just like Moses. And and so many people believed that when this prophet came, he would be the Messiah. And so the prophet and the Messiah were, were almost identical. Many people think that Jesus is the prophet that Moses said uh, God would send, who would be just like Moses. Others were saying, this is the Christ. But I want you to look at the people who don't believe. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Again, some people believe and some people don't. And in this case, uh, the reason people don't believe isn't a misconception. is They just don't know the facts. Uh, they say, look, the Messiah is from Bethlehem. He's from the, the family of David. Jesus is from Galilee. Therefore, Jesus can't be the Messiah. And yet, where was Jesus born? Well, we know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And what family did Jesus come from? He came from the family of David. But none of these people ask him, where were you born? 
None of these people ask him, what family did you come from? They just assume that they know the truth. They know he's from Galilee. He can't be the Messiah. Uh, prejudice themselves against him. Faith is not blind. Faith is based on knowledge. There are 365 prophecies in the Old Testament about the Messiah, which Jesus fulfills. But you have to go to the work to, to find those prophecies and see if Jesus fulfilled them before you can come to faith. And the problem a lot of us make when it comes to Jesus is we're too lazy to really look at the evidence for faith. We dismiss Jesus out of hand because we don't want to have to do the hard work to find out, is he really who he said he was? I, you know, every, just about every decision I've ever made that I've ended up regretting came about the same way. I didn't research the facts. I went with my gut. I went with what felt right at the moment. I went with what I wanted to do, only to have those facts that I neglected to look at later come back and bite me. Lori and I have uh, leased cars for years, and uh, we have our own little system. Uh, we do every, every three years. We take in our old car and, and uh, take a new one. We always uh, lease Honda Accords uh, because they're bulletproof, and they hold the resale value, which lowers the lease payments. We always go to the same dealership. We always put the same amount of money down. And our monthly payments are almost always the same. It's been doing this for years. Well, recently, our, our, the lease ran out on the car we had. And so we took it in to the dealership. And, and the only decision we made was what color were we going to get. We have been leasing gray Honda Accords for over a decade. We were tired of gray. So we decided the only decision we needed to make was what color, and we decided to go with blue because loyal Cal fans, we were going to get a dark blue car. And so uh, we were on the lot for all of five minutes, and the salesman had already showed us a, a beautiful blue Honda Accord. We knew what to do. I knew what to do. We had a system. So went in, uh, signed all the contracts, put the same amount of money down as we always put down, drove away with our new Honda Accord, just like we always do. But a month later, I get the bill for our first payment, and it is much more than our normal bill was. And, I, and I'm, I, I'm puzzled by this. I go back to our contract, which, by the way, I never read because I, I do this all the time. And, and I realize that we normally lease a new Honda from the previous model year to get a better deal. This year, when we saw the blue one, didn't even bother to look at what the model year is. We got a brand new one of the newest year, and so we paid more. Again, because I didn't investigate the facts, um, I, I suffered the consequences. Same thing happened with Jesus for years. I refused to look at the facts about Jesus because I didn't want to believe in Jesus. I, I had a, a, a view of Jesus that prejudiced me against him. I had grown up in the church, and I didn't want that. I was afraid that, that Jesus was going to make me do something I didn't want to do, keep me from doing what I wanted to do. I didn't want to look at the evidence. I didn't want to look at, 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 at the proof for Jesus. I just, I just was prejudiced against him. I, w I wouldn't look at all. And it wasn't until my need for spirituality drove me to him. And then I began to finally look at it without prejudice. And I realized that I've been rejecting the wrong person. I've been rejecting a faith that I really didn't understand at all. How about you? If you don't believe in Jesus, ask yourself why. What evidence do I have that Jesus is not the Son of God? What evidence do I have that he's not the Messiah, the Savior, who he claims to be? And is the fact that you're rejecting him not on the basis of evidence, not on the basis of fact, but more on the basis of your own desires? You don't want him 
to be the Messiah, and therefore you're not willing to look further. So prejudice is, is, is one reason we have doubts about Jesus. We prejudge Jesus on the basis of misconceptions and misinformation rather than, than doing the hard work of really finding out if what I believe is based on fact rather than my own feelings and emotions. Now, there's another reason in this passage where people don't believe in Jesus, and that's peer pressure. Uh, we, we're social creatures. We tend to believe what the people around us believe. That's why there's red states and blue states. It, it, it's hard to go against the crowd. I, I like what Marcus Aurelius, the, uh, the philosopher and Caesar said. He says, it's a constantly amazing to me that we love ourselves more than anyone else. Yet we put other people, more people's opinions are more important to us than our, what we think about things. We, we tend to believe what other people believe. We mistrust what we think is true, but nobody else is true. And that's what happens in the, in the following passage. Verse 45. The officers, and, and these are the officers that the temple authorities had sent, the temple police had sent to arrest Jesus, uh, the officers then came back to the chief priests and Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd which does not know the law is accursed. What is is the council's argument against Jesus. It's real simple. The experts don't believe in him. The educated people don't believe in him. The people who know their Bibles don't believe in him. The people who believe in him are ignorant hicks. Now, you don't want to be like them. This is the classic bandwagon argument that if the people who know, the intellectuals, the experts, the leaders, the majority don't believe something that can't be true, but the fact is, something is either true or false, whether people believe in it or not. And, and has the majority ever been wrong? Well, the majority of people once believed that the world was flat, that the sun rotated around the earth, that slavery was normal, that abolitionists were extreme. Uh, most of the people in Germany thought that the Nazis had some good ideas at one time. I mean, you, you, it'd be a a better question would be, has the majority ever been right? And yet, it is so easy because of social pressure and because we don't want to be thrown off the island and because we don't want to be ostracized that we don't believe in Jesus because the people around us don't believe in him. We don't think independently. Well, there was some independent thinking on the council. Let's read on here. Now, Nicodemus, verse 50, Nicodemus, he who came to him before being one of them, remember we met Nicodemus back in chapter 3, and when he comes himself and talks to Jesus, he said to them, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? You need to talk to him like I talk to him. They answered him, you are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet comes from Gal arises out of Galilee. Well, the, the Pharisees are using the same argument that's been used throughout this passage. Jesus is from Galilee, therefore Jesus can't be the, the uh, Messiah. But they hadn't really done their homework because, in fact, the Old Testament did say that a prophet would come from Galilee. Matthew actually says, now when Jesus heard that John, John the Baptist, had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. He, he moved his base of operations from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. And leaving Nazareth, his hometown, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This, this move to Galilee was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land, 
and the shadow of death. Upon them a light dawned. This is quoting from Isaiah 9, 1, and 2. And that passage is followed immediately by the famous words from Isaiah 9, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. That, that's the light that's going to appear in Galilee. And government will rest on his shoulders. So there'll be a man, a son who's given, and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. So he's not only a man, but he's also God. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and of his kingdom. So he'll be the Messiah. So right there in, in Isaiah 9, Isaiah says there will indeed be a prophet who comes from Galilee. Not just a prophet, but God in human flesh who will come and be the Messiah. But peer pressure is powerful. It is hard to go against the stream. Uh, but truth is truth, whether anybody else believes it or not. And that's why it's so important that, that we learn to think independently. We learn to th- make up our own minds. Even if your friends don't believe in Jesus, even if your family doesn't believe in Jesus, that doesn't mean that Jesus is false. And this is especially for, for those of you, it's especially important for, for you who are parents of kids. I've seen so many Uh, kids who grew up in Creekside who have followed the faith of their parents. When they go to college, they lose their faith because there are plenty of professors in college who want to uh, disillusion Christian students of of their beliefs and what they grew up believing and will give them all the evidences why Jesus can't be who he said he is. And unless your child has learned to think independently, unless their faith is their own, I, I believe in Jesus not because mom and dad believe him, not because my church believes him, not because of the youth group. I believe in Jesus because I've investigated Jesus. I've brought my doubts and and had them answered. Those are the people, people who can think independently or that will withstand the attacks on their faith. And that's why it's important to talk to your kids about their doubts, about why they believe and what they believe. uh, So they are prepared as they leave your home and go out in the world to defend their faith and to hang on, hang on to their faith. Doubts are normal. Doubts are necessary. But we have to use, embrace those doubts and use them as a motivation to learn more about Jesus because the more you learn about Jesus, the more your doubts will be dispelled and the stronger your faith will grow. Let's pray. Father, thank you that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ and that our doubts drive us to your word to find out what's really true and is there a reason to believe and we thank you so much that you've given us clear and firm and unshakable reasons to trust in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. Strangely dead.
Him in the light of His glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory. In the light of His glory